Chapter 13 The Valley The police car pulled in front of the only store in Leeds. The officer let Richard out of the back seat, and they both walked in together. As soon as the door closed behind them, the officer retrieved two cans out of a cooler as if by instinct and handed one to Richard. Two grape sodas on my tab, Judy, he hollered to no one there. Okay, came a woman's voice from the back. They relaxed on either side of a small table, and the officer handed Richard a straw out of the dispenser. Thank you. Richard acknowledged after opening his can of soda and dropping the straw in. The officer waited. It seemed important to him that they take their first drink together. You must play pretty well if my mother buys your music. When Richard looked up, the officer grinned. Richard finally gave in and smiled back. See, you look better already, Mr. Gaspar. The officer seemed puzzled. So, you came all the way out here to buy a violin of his, and now he won't sell you one. That is a curious situation. The smile immediately left Richard's face. He is a different man, sitting out there carving on those little pieces of wood. It would drive anyone else crazy. He does a lot of strange things, too, you know. Come to think of it, I bet he does about everything there is out there. The officer sat back as if pondering his own words. I know, replied Richard. He gave me a tour of the shop. The officer spoke with admiration. I've lived here all my life, Mr. Gaspar. Almost everyone in these parts has, and not one of us ever had any idea what was under that big pile of dirt north of town till he moved back and started digging. Richard's interest was piqued, but he decided not to admit that he had missed his chance to ask about the ancient stone stairway because of his temper. Back? inquired Richard. He grew up out there in the sand and sagebrush, replied the officer. Pretty dire straits, too. He disappeared the summer after he graduated from high school. No one knows where he went for all those years or where he got his money. But after uncovering those remains and building his shop around it, he gave the whole town a tour. That's how my family got to see it all. Pretty impressive, eh? And that valley. Whoa! Richard shook his head. If you only saw what's on top, Mr. Gaspar, you have no idea. You don't know the half of it. What valley? Richard could hardly believe that there was more than what he had already seen. Then you didn't go down the road behind the shop? Richard shook his head once more, and the officer continued. Well, if you keep on going... That dirt and gravel eventually turns into the smoothest cobblestone road you ever saw. Smooth as glass. Then it drops down into his valley. Some even call it the Valley of Dreams. The officer made sure by the tone in his voice that Richard took everything he said seriously. It's like the Garden of Eden down there, Mr. Gaspar. And that's where everything else is. The officer's voice lowered and became intense, prompting Richard to sit forward in his chair. He only gave a Reader's Digest tour to the rest of the town. I got to go further back in when I was on duty one night. I heard what sounded like dynamite blasts going off, and I figured that he had reopened the silver mine. He has a silver mine for his fittings, the officer added. When the officer paused, Richard nodded, even though he had a hard time imagining it. Well, his mine shaft isn't that far from the edge of town, and the folks who like going to bed early began calling in. But, as the law states, in the county it's perfectly legal until 10 p.m., so I told them to relax and mind their P's and Q's. Well, 10 p.m. rolled around, and two minutes later... Boom! 
the biggest blast of all. When the next call came in, I had to file a report. It was the last blast, the officer announced in the same official tone that he had used while placing Richard in the back seat of his patrol car. But the law is the law, and it was 10.02. I hadn't been back in that valley since I was a boy anyway, and I was curious to see what he had done with the place, or if he had unearthed anything else. It became obvious to Richard that the officer's greatest pleasure in life was a cool drink and a captive audience. The officer's eyes widened. My headlights shone on trees like I've never seen before. Plants that looked like dinosaurs should be eaten off them. There were statues unearthed everywhere. And the further I went, the more sensational it all became. Mind you, it's a barren desert all around, and even though I rode horses out there when I was young, there was no clue of what was buried beneath those cliffs. Why, we all thought his father was plumb crazy when he bought that pile of rocks from old man Stratton. The officer, wanting to show off his knowledge, commented, He even grows his own cotton in that valley, Mr. Gaspar, makes his clothes out of it, and the paper for his labels. Good paper is made from cotton, you know. The officer waited for Richard to acknowledge his tidbit of knowledge, then continued. Anyway, to make a long story short, or in my case, a little less long, the officer grinned. Everything in this world that you didn't see in that shop up above is down there in that valley of his. Not just artifacts, but glass-blowing ovens earth-moving equipment, and machinery. Why, he even has his own refinery. Well, I gave him the warning about the noise ordinance, and he apologized for the last blast after ten. He then explained how his wife had wanted him to finish that night, so he placed the last charge even though it was late. The officer winked at Richard. He'll do anything for that wife of his. The officer glanced out the window as a car passed by, then turned back toward Richard. He leaned closer and whispered, She's something to behold, Mr. Gaspar. Yet some of the stories I've heard about her would... Judy walked over from behind the counter and tapped the officer on the shoulder. Don't you think you've tortured this man enough, Fred? The officer sat back in his chair while Judy retreated behind the counter. Richard could tell by their interaction that he wasn't the first person ever forced to drink a grape soda at that particular table. After being accused of gossiping on the job, the officer quickly concluded, Anyway, if you only saw what's on top, Mr. Gaspar, you have no idea. Even though Richard knew that freedom was within his grasp if he didn't ask any more questions, he was having a difficult time imagining everything the officer had described. What's it all for? The officer seemed pleased with Richard's interest. Well, Mr. Gaspar, when I asked Sean Diego that exact same question, he answered with the most devoted look you ever saw, kind of like a priest in church saying prayers. My violins. I don't know, but anyone who would do all that for a pound of wood you hold under your chin must truly love it. I know he doesn't do it for the money. With that, the officer slurped down the last of his soda and pushed back his chair. Were you going to return when the violin was done or stick around? I was going to stay and prepare for my next concert, then take it back with me. And now? I don't know. Well, let's get going while I tell you what I don't know. Richard finished his drink and followed the officer out to the patrol car, wondering what he meant. He actually found himself wanting to hear what the officer had to say next. Well, I don't know what your whole situation is, Mr. Gaspar. After closing Richard's door for him, the officer took a moment to situate himself behind the wheel. 
But what I told you before about those people driving up and down this road is no hogwash. He started the engine, carefully looked both ways two times, even though there wasn't another vehicle in sight, then pulled onto Main Street. I don't know of anyone, anywhere, who has bought one of his instruments that hasn't been happy in the long haul. I'm the law around here day and night, and I hear everything bad that anyone does, down to pulling puppies' tails. And out of all the stories I've heard from out there, I don't know of anyone who ever claimed he cheated them. Richard was skeptical. He knew how fickle musicians could be about the most frivolous things. Are you telling me that everyone who has gone out there has been totally satisfied and that he's never had an instrument brought back? The officer looked at Richard in the rearview mirror. Oh, there's been a couple bring them back, driving up the street with their scowling faces, just as I told you. But every time they go out there, no matter who they are or what their complaint is, when they come back down the street, they're as happy as little kittens licking at a warm bowl of milk. Richard had never heard of any maker who could claim what this officer was saying, that everyone was satisfied. He was about to question the officer's statement again, then noticed the blazer in the distance and decided against it. After pulling to a stop and letting Richard out, the officer added, Here's my advice, Mr. Gaspar. If you really can write out a check for a violin of his, do it. Whatever he asks you to do, even if it includes standing on your head and rubbing your belly, just do it. I don't know everything about him. We don't sit down and eat Sunday pie together. But I do know this. He loves those instruments. I've seen it in his eyes. He won't cheat you, and you won't be sorry. After Richard lifted the handle and climbed in the blazer, he fastened his seatbelt and started the engine. The officer smiled. And it'll save you a lot of money on speeding tickets. Somehow, Richard felt better, even though the officer had said nothing that should have logically changed his mind. The luthier had still burned Samuel's check, and the Guanarius was still waiting for him in New York. Yet, by the time he pulled into the hotel parking lot in St. George, he decided that he was going to sleep on it. After eating an early dinner, Richard opened his violin case. While looking through his program, he began thinking about master violins and the great performers who had owned them. He reminisced about the painting on his grandfather's wall and his thoughts centered around Niccolo Paganini. Richard knew that some of the critics had hated Paganini, calling him a charlatan and a clown. But there were others who listened to him once and then sold all they owned so they could follow him across Europe, living and breathing just to hear one more note from his magic violin. It was said that Paganini could make his violin mimic an opera singer's voice to perfection, or bark like a dog, cackle like a chicken, and sing a song more pure and lovely than songbirds. The historians wrote about how he would stand on stage and have to wait 15 minutes for the applause to die down. They described his descending arpeggios like they were sparkling diamonds being poured from a silk bag. He would play them just to tease the audience because it sent shivers down their spines and would throw them into another 15-minute frenzy of applause. All before he started the printed program. Once the concerts began, he could have the audience spellbound within a measure, laughing after three more bars, crying in depression and misery, then laughing again, all with one more sweep of his bow across the strings. And he would do it until most of them had passed out from exhaustion or pure ecstasy and needed to be carried away on stretchers. 
There were no recordings ever made of Paganini, and Richard knew that modern critics believed the reviews to be exaggerated. When Paganini's famous violin was finally taken out of the vault, modern performers couldn't make it do what the old critics claimed, so they insisted that his violin was also exaggerated. Yet Richard and his grandfather had always believed in Paganini, all the stories and all the unbelievable claims. When Richard had told Michelle that he wanted to be the greatest player who ever lived, it was that kind of player, and she had believed in him. Something then struck Richard that he had never thought of. Was it Paganini's skill or the violin? Or was it only possible with them both together? After three hours of intense practicing, Richard put his Berganzi back in its case and climbed into bed. She is a good violin, even tone, good volume, and a wonderful instrument. But Circe's right. There is something she lacks that I need. When Richard tried sleeping, Circe's words about the Jewish boy haunted him, and he found himself looking over at the Berganzi in the moonlight. Who are you? he whispered. To Richard's surprise, Samuel's words echoed back and drifted across his pillow. He will make the instrument you need. With his consciousness fading into a mist, Richard realized that he was doing something that he hadn't done in years. He was dreaming.